Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. You probably know by now that we study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular lesson we think is a very interesting, or well, a series, is a very interesting series on the book of Job. And this particular lesson is lesson number eight in that series for November 19 of 2016, entitled Innocent Blood. Hmm, Innocent Blood? What would that be? Well, let's see if we can figure that out as we study our lessons together. As usual, we'd like to ask you to bow your heads with us as we begin our time together. Our wonderful Father, as we consider this incredible experience that Job went through and what all was behind it, we still only know very little about the council in heaven, the discussion between you and Satan, and what Satan then went forth and did, and then all these accusations against Job. Help us to see exactly where we need to distinguish between the true and the false, because they are really mixed up in this book, and it, that's intentional on the part of Satan. He doesn't tell us just falsehood. He mixes as much of the truth as he can with his falsehood. So we need to be very careful and very discerning in, in, in separating it out. Guide us now in that discussion is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> We're going to start far away from the book of Job in Hebrews. Chapter 11, verse 1, which says, To have faith is to be sure of the things we hope for, to be certain of the things we cannot see. Now, we're going to talk about hope. We're going to talk about other things going on here. But think about that as we, as we talk about this. This was, was on the Sabbath afternoon section of our Bible study guide. Algerian-born writer Albert Camus struggled with the question of human suffering. In his book, The Plague, he used a plague as a metaphor for the ills that bring pain and suffering upon humanity. He depicted a scene in which a little boy, afflicted with the pestilence, dies a horrific death. Afterward, a priest, who had been a witness to the tragedy, said to the doctor who had been there too, that sort of thing is revolting because it passes our human understanding. But perhaps we should love what we cannot understand. The doctor, enraged, snapped back, No, Father, I have a very different idea of love, and until my dying day I shall refuse to love a scheme of things in which children are put to torture. That sort of makes it pretty stark, doesn't it? Was Is Job it tortured? He was tortured. The question might be by whom or by what. Yeah, he was tortured. Tortured by disease. He was tortured, tortured by doubts. He was tortured by remorse about what's happened to his possessions and especially to his children. And insinuations from his friends. Yeah. Maybe more than just insinuations, yeah. straight out. Accusations. Yeah, accusations. Strong accusations. Yeah. Because of you, your children died. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Is it possible to make sense of the world in which we live? Is it fair that thousands of children are dying in war-ravaged Syria and other countries at war? Is it fair that billions of people are being born in countries with little or no access to the truth about God? I don't know, we could probably spend the whole time discussing any one of those three questions. In much of the book of Job, we find Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar, we're going to get very familiar with those names, doing their best under the inspiration of the devil himself to break down Job. Now, not everybody would recognize that that's what was happening here, but I'm absolutely certain that was true. Much of what they say might actually be true. It is true that we are all sinners. Let's, let's, let's not pretend like we're not sinners. In fact, he was suffering because according to God's righteous judgment, he was blameless and upright. Now think about that. Here's a person who is suffering incredibly. Not because he was a sinner, but because he was righteous. Is that right? Is that fair? Elsewhere in the Bible, we find numerous examples of people who, who did die 
because of their own sins, beginning with the flood. The firstborn in Egypt, the t at the time of the tenth plague, of course. We could go on talking about Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. We could talk about Nadab and Abihu. We could talk about Uzzah. There's a whole list of people, the 185,000 Assyrians that were destroyed outside of Jerusalem. But the book of Job is troubling because Job did not die because of his own sins, although his three friends are certain that it must have been true. Um, imagine how Job felt being accused by them when he did, knew he didn't deserve it. In fact, Job didn't die at all, did he? He thought he was going to die. And that's one of the things we're going to discuss here in these uh, few moments we have together. Our Bible study guide skips over Job 9, but I'm going to look at part of that. Job is responding to the accusations of Bildad. Yes, I've heard all that before, but how can a human being with a, win a case against God? And then he discusses how could it be that, I mean, what is Job doing here? Let, let's be clear. He's reading the place now where he's not arguing with his friends. He's in effect arguing with God, right? Do you think he thought he was arguing with God, or was he just arguing with the friends? Well, um, do you think that he, I, I'm pretty sure he didn't know that his story would be discussed in, in 2016. Yeah. But, but did he, I don't see that he really went eyeball to eyeball with God and challenged him. Or, you know, there's an area there you challenge, you accuse. He seemed to be, while he was suffering, he was putting up with his lot, trying to figure out what was going on. Listen to these words. God passed, these are, these are Job speaking. God, this would be starting with verse 11 of chapter 9 of Job. God passes by, but I cannot see him. He takes what he wants and no one can stop him. No one dares ask him, what are you doing? So it sounds a little bit like he's accusing God. God's anger is constant. He crushes his enemy. He crushed his enemies who helped Rahab, the sea monster, oppose him. So how can I find words to answer God? Though I am innocent, all I can do is beg for mercy from God, my judge. Yet even then, if he lets me speak, I can't believe he would listen to me. He sends storms to batter and bruise me without any reason at all. He won't let me get my breath. He has filled my life with bitterness. Should I try force, try force on God? Should I take him to court? Could anyone make him go? I am innocent and faithful, but my words sound guilty, and everything I say seems to condemn me. I am innocent, but I no longer care. I am sick of living. Nothing matters, innocent or guilty. God will destroy us. When an innocent person suddenly dies, God laughs. Think that's true? Maybe even something that Job said wasn't true? Is that what you're suggesting? Sounds like it, doesn't it? He, Job's basically repeating what his friends have already said. He gave the world to the wicked. He made all the judges blind. And then a sentence which I think is a, a key to understanding the whole book. And if God didn't do it, who did? Don't you think that was Job's really real question? He said earlier he had faith. Mm -hmm. But it would seem one of his accusers uh, got frightened when he was trying to sleep. We know oh, that was the devil. Job doesn't seem to mention that. Maybe mm -hmm. he didn't know. It, it's. Uh, well, he goes on down, starting with verse 29. Since I'm held guilty, why should I bother? And, and, and then just above that, I know that God does hold me guilty. I'm reading the Good News Bible. No soap can wash away my sins. God throws me into a pit of filth, and even my clothes are ashamed of me. If God were human, I could answer him. We could go to court to decide our quarrel. But there's no one to step, to step between us, no one to judge both God and me. Stop punish me, God, punishing me, God. Keep your terrors away. I'm not afraid. I'm going to talk because I know my own heart. And then he goes on, I'm tired of living. Listen to my bitter complaint. Don't condemn me, God. Tell me, what is the charge against me? Is it right for you to be so cruel? Is it right uh, to despise what you yourself have made and then to smile on the schemes of wicked people? Do you see things as we do? Is your life as short as ours? 
then why do you track down all my sins and hurt, hunt down every fault I have? You know that I'm not guilty, that no one can save me from you. Your hands formed and shaped me, and now those same hands destroy me? Remember that you made me from clay? Are you going to crush me back to dust? You gave my father strength to beget me. You made my mother grow in my, in my mother's womb. I mean, you made me grow in my mother's womb. You formed my body with bones and sinews and covered the bones with muscles and skin. You have given me life and constant love, and your care has kept me alive. So Job is struggling here. God has taken good care of him. He's appreciating what God has done. He says, you, you, you gave me life. But now it, it seems, God, like, like you're trying to destroy me. So how would you respond to that kind of an argument? In today's terms, or? <laughs> <laughs> In today's terms. I mean, don't, don't we have we so much more information yeah. about God and it's hard to the not, other side. Yeah, well, it's hard not to, to let the extra information that we have, yeah. you know, enter into our discussion. So do you think that Job knew about Genesis 3, the conflict in the Garden of Eden? Do you think he had verbal transmission of that even if it wasn't written down? Probably. Some kind of idea about it. But he doesn't seem to realize it's the devil, as we call it. Mm -hmm. At least it's not in there, per se, mm -hmm. in relation to him, which strikes me as being a little, comp little peculiar in, in the fact of his relationship with God. If you are interested in digging into this issue a little bit more, in our, well, on our website at www.theox.org, that's T-H-E-O-X.org, if you look under the teacher's guides and under writings, you'll find a handout entitled, If God Didn't Do It, Who Did? Quoted, of course, right out of nine, uh, Job 9.24. That lays out a number of the issues that Job was talking about in this, in this lesson we're talking about now. Well, is it... Do you want it, to summarize that handout? I, I don't. It be? <laughs> well, it's, it's pretty concentrated, and I'm not because it, it then talks about the issues in the whole book and how they sum up and so forth. So um, I think we better save those discussions until we get a little further along. Well, in his suffering, even Job wished that he had never been born. I mean, can you understand that? Or perhaps he says, if, if I was born, why didn't you just let me die before my first breath? And, and we can understand why he might think like that, with all his pain and so forth. I mean, he couldn't even get a decent night's sleep, I'm sure. Well, can you think of other people in the Bible who maybe suffered because they were good people? Jesus. Jesus. Anybody else? And Paul mentions a whole litany of things that he endured, shipwrecked, yep. beaten, pris imprisoned. Uh, Second Corinthians 11 and 12, yeah. How about Joseph? Yeah, Joseph. Daniel. Daniel, yeah. Well, I I've recorded this verse before, but I'm going to record it again right now from my Good News Bible, 2 Timothy 3.12. Do you out there think this verse is still true? Everyone who wants to live a godly life in union with Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Do you think that's true? Yes. Definitely. Is, are we all being persecuted today? We've got to look at the evening news. They're getting it elsewhere in the world. It won't be long yeah. before it'll be here. So if I'm not being persecuted, does that mean I'm not living the right kind of life? Well, that's the question. So. In this lesson, we are, we're struggling between some pretty, with some pretty big challenges. Well, it wouldn't have to be a continual persecution. Yeah. It could be episodic. Sure. Yeah. It's just coming. So a couple of facts, which can make this discussion even worse. One, we are all sinners, and thus, ultimately, we all deserve to die, right? But Job knew that he had not done something horrendously, some horrendously awful sin that was responsible for his suffering. So why did all that happen to him? 
So, okay, so then one, let's make that point very clear. We're all sinners. We all deserve to die. Okay, so what else? As we have stated on several occasions, we believe it is impossible to explain what was happening in this story or in much of the evil events in the history of our world without an understanding of the great controversy over God's character and government. Now, two, we must also remember that we are in the middle of that great controversy, but that the great controversy itself will only last for a brief period of time in contrast to the eternity which God promises to give all his faithful people. So, and a question we've asked before, but I'm going to throw it in here. Don't we believe that heaven is going to be a beautiful place with no, no sorrow, no pain, no suffering of any kind? So why do we need to go through pain and suffering here to get there? Do we need to be persecuted in order to go to a place where there's no persecution? Well, it wasn't intended to be that way in the per first place. True. We're just in this pickle because we're part of Adam's offspring. Okay. And so we're in this world of where there's good and evil. Uh, and so sometimes we experience good and sometimes we experience evil. And some, sometimes in greater measure one thing than the other. Do you think that, um, I mean, in the, in the case of Job, obviously, he was very righteous and he suffered horrendously. Do you think there are people who are having Job-like experiences in our day? Sure. Yeah. Sure. I think there are those of us, we don't really know how many, but are going to be active participants in this kind of thing in the last days. Yeah. You've only got to watch the news here to see some mm -hmm. of what comes from back east out of the government. You realize how close some of that could be. In Deuteronomy 29, 19, it says these words. And now remember, what, what, was De what, what did we find in Deuteronomy? What's Deuteronomy made up of? The law. Uh, re recounting the Three sermons of Moses. His final speeches to the people of Israel. So in there, yes, of course, the law is in there. A lot of recounting, basically, a lot of things that he hoped they would have learned from their experiences together. So now he's concluding. Make sure that there is no one here today who hears these solemn demands and yet convinces himself that all will be well with him even if he stubbornly goes his own way. That would destroy all of you, good and evil alike. Why is that? I mean, shouldn't God protect the righteous? But you're we're... hoping for perfect justice, <laughs> and that's not going to come until... Not in this, there's not perfect justice in this world? No, we, we can hope for it and we can strive for it, but it's, if we're expecting it to always be like it should have been, or would have been in Eden, or, and will be in the earth made new, yeah. we're, we're thinking the wrong thing. Well, Isaiah, you remember the story of Isaiah and his experiences of things were really bad at that point in time. Isaiah 59 verse 7 says, and he's speaking to the people of Jerusalem, you are always planning something evil and you can hardly wait to do it. You never hesitate to murder innocent people. You leave ruin and destruction wherever you go and no one is safe when you are about. What does that tell us? Does that sound a little bit like 2016? <laughs> I mean, you yes. almost every... Uh, and, uh, I'm getting sick of this idea that the news people go by, if it bleeds, it leads. So every morning you turn on the news and someone is shot, someone is killed, and it, it always seemed to be, they were just innocently walking down the street. Right? How often have you heard that? Yeah. Or sometimes they're, they're not even walking down the street. They're inside their house and someone shoots a, a bullet through the wall. Well. So, um, innocent people are not free from suffering. And That's so, an argument against Satan's kingdom. Mm -hmm. That there is not justice for for the righteous. Someone once said, your birth... What? At least in the immediate sense. Yeah. yeah. 
Someone once said that your birth certificate is proof of your guilt. Is that true? Well, you, you'll recognize there are some ideas along, along the lines of original sin. What's original sin? What do you mean if you say original sin? Anybody? Original guilt, I think. Okay, so, some people would say original guilt. Okay, what does that mean? We Adventists aren't very good at original sin. Well, in, in the Old Testament, I, it's, I think Ezekiel or someplace where it says uh, each person will live or die for their own sins, not for their father's sins. Or, you know. Ezekiel 18 and 36 and yeah. several places. Okay, but the idea of original sin as propounded by, I think, um, Augustine. Augustine, I think, was the yeah, first one who did it. The idea was that somehow or other we all are partially guilty because of Adam's sin, Adam's and Eve's sin. That, ma that makes every, in other words, their guilt gets shared with all of us. Is that true? No, I think we just inherit a fallen nature, and as a result of that, we uh, choose to sin. Well, it seems to me like there's a very fine line, because I read your note earlier, and I thought, boy, I see where you're going, but it's not that far apart. Well, Romans 5.12, which is often the verse people quote when they talk about original sin, says, sin came into the world through one man. And his sin, his sin brought death with it. Now we all, I don't think any of us have a question about that. As a result, death has spread to the whole human race because, because Adam sinned? No, but because everyone has sinned. In other words, the reason we're in this predicament is not because Adam sinned, but because we're following his example. They don't like to talk about that, but because that makes them responsible. Well, <clears throat> so... If you, that's what you mean by original sin, that's kosher. But if you mean by original sin that we are somehow sinful or guilty because of Adam's original sin, that's not true. We are guilty because of our own sins. However, it is true that because of their sin, let's be clear about this, we no longer have the option of living in the Garden of Eden. So I can't go back and say, well, because I didn't, obviously I've sinned plenty, so... Um, I can't even claim that I was, but if there were possible for me to say I'm sinless and I want to be back in the Garden of Eden, I still can't do that, even if I had never committed a sin. We are all excluded from the Garden of Eden because we're descendants of Adam and Eve. So that's also true. Well, there are a number of passages in the Bible that clearly say that we are all sinners. I, Romans 3.23 is the best known one where it says everyone has sinned and is far away from God's saving presence. But I like to go back to the Old Testament. Look at 1 Kings 8.46. This is right in the middle of Solomon's prayer of dedication for his, his temple. And try to imagine the scene because I'm sure that when that temple was dedicated, there were a lot of people from the surrounding nations there. It was a huge, the, all the Israelites, everybody could possibly get there was there. This was a huge gathering. And, and so he's, part of what he's, he's doing here is he's, he's preaching to the, to the crowds, and, and including not just Jewish crowds, but a lot of, of others. And he said, when your people sin against you, of course he's praying, when your people sin against you, talking to God, and there is no one who does not sin, and in your anger, you let them enemies defeat them, take them as prisoners to some other land, even if that land is far away. Listen to your people's prayers and so forth. He goes on. So it was pretty clear to Solomon that we're all sinners, right? And there's a, when you read that, you, you think of Daniel 9 in his prayer, and he's really doing what Solomon is, is indicating will, will come about. And he's, he's including himself. We have sinned. Mm -hmm. He's not saying these other people have sinned. Yeah. Uh, well, Solomon, toward the end of his life, in writing Ecclesiastes, put it th this way. There is no one on earth who does what is right all the time and never makes a mistake. And certainly not him by that time. And certainly not him under those circumstances. 
Well, in light of all that, wouldn't life be hopeless without knowing about the life and death of Jesus Christ and what he's accomplished with us through that, even through his death on the cross and his resurrection? Are we saying that Job's and Abraham's life was uh, hopeless? Because that they were before the cross. But they still had a relationship with God. And even though we recognize that the, the experience of Jesus Christ makes those issues plain as can be, um, they still understood them to a certain extent, I, I'm sure, in the Old Testament. You know, Ellen White says that people like Moses and Abraham actually saw in vision the days of Jesus. So I don't know how, how much they passed along. And we don't know whether Job was before them or after them, but... Um, well, he would have probably been after Enoch, and so there would be oh, this, yeah. this knowledge that it was possible to go to heaven. Um, well, then Eliphaz comes along, and he's ready for round two. Actually, yeah, this is round two. Can any human being be really pure? Can anyone be right with God? Why, God does not trust even his angels. Even they are not pure in his sight. And people drink evil as if it were water. Yes, they are corrupt. They are worthless. Does that sound familiar to you? It's from the dream or vision that he had. Back in chapter 4, almost verbatim, isn't it? Yeah. So. The dream, vision, or nightmare. Yeah, a nightmare maybe. Well, while it is true that we are all frail creatures of clay, none of us would argue with that, I hope, and could die at any moment, and also that sin and suffering are universal facts of life on this earth, we can look beyond all of that to God's promise of a future better life. Have you ever tried to, have you ever discussed with a person who, who's an atheist or a person who's an evolutionist and, and really believes in, in the Big Bang and ask them what hope they have for the future? What did they say? I, I asked you first. <laughs> <laughs> well, you asked me if I'd asked anyone, and I'll say no. Okay. But if I did, what would they say? Mm. Yeah. Well, I remember reading a thread of something where that issue came up to a particular person, and his response was, well, don't think about it too much. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, and even in this lesson, we're going to see as we get down near the end. Our friend Camus says, so what? I mean, what's going to happen? Well, Ellen White puts it quite differently. She says in Patriarchs and Prophets 129, paragraph 3, God has always tried his people in the furnace of affliction. Does God intentionally do that? It is in the heat of the furnace that the dross is separated from the true gold of the Christian character. Now, I asked you earlier, if we're going to go and live a perfect place where there's no problems, why do we have to go through all this? Does that, do, do those words help to make, give you some idea why? What does the persecution, what does the tribulation, um, what does that do to us? Because of our situation it, it, with all of this dross, that we've accumulated uh, that needs to be separated. Now Adam and Eve had the opportunity of, of making the right choice and uh, if they hadn't fallen then we wouldn't be in this situation. But because we're in this situation where there's good and evil, uh, God is working through that to try to bring uh, us to good and uh, separate us from whatever evil we want to bring with us. Mm -hmm. Well, having read the book, entire book of Job on more than one occasion, and I hope that's your experience as well, you might be able to say that many people have learned important lessons from this book. I, th I think it's a very profitable book. It is one of the clearest pictures in Scripture for us to view what goes on in the great controversy. Why do I say that? Job 1 and 2. Job 1 and 2, especially, yeah. But there are many instances of suffering for which, from our limited perspective, we can see no reason. What do we do about those? How do you explain the death of those apparently innocent Christians who have been killed instantly in one way or another? What about those who are suffering, having never known anything about God? Is that fair? 
And what about those whose terrible experiences have only made them more angry and hateful toward God? Have they learned anything? And not just to mention human beings, what about, we just, we've just had some horrendous fires around here. Is it fair for animals to get caught in the middle of a forest fire and burn to death? You think God had that in mind when he created us? No. Knowledge of evil. What about the thousands of people who've died in natural disasters? Or civilians caught in the middle of a, of, of, of a war? Everyone, you know, fairly frequently now we're seeing pictures of horrendous things happening in, in the different Sir cities in Syria. I mean, if it's not one side bombing them, it's the other side bombing them. Um, do those people fit with the same category with Job's children? What do you think? Well, no one. I think there's a chance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. A lot of those people, they've got a religion we don't agree with, but in the mm -hmm. final analysis, my, God might judge them on how they kept it in the long run. Well, one thing we must never forget in all this discussion is every single one of those people who has died will be raised back to life again, either at the second coming and taken to heaven or at the third coming where they'll come up and surround the city of God but every single one of them, and what will they see? Every one of us, all of us, what will we see at that point in time? That great panorama. And if you don't know about the panorama, really, really, really important to read Great Controversy, page 666. You should be able to remember that number up to page 668. And it discusses the panorama. And the whole, everyone who's ever lived virtually is going to be there outside the city or inside the city watching God's great portrayal of the entire great controversy from beginning to end. So what about children? We're just, I don't know if I need to make this any worse. What about children who die of cancer? Young college women, we see this on the news all the time, who are sexually assaulted and, and then brutally killed. What about the 19,000 Japanese who were killed in the Tohoku earthquake, and remember the nuclear plant there and all. Were they guilty of some horrendous sin? What about think. children through the ages? That's one I often ponder. Mm -hmm. I mean, if their parents are resurrected and the judge worthy to go to heaven, do the children go with them? I guess, but what about the children born to parents that have no idea or want anything to do with Yeah, them? exactly. Well, Ellen White does say that there's going to be children in heaven whose parents are not there. Now, how that works out or why, or what age those children are, were they old enough to make some of their own decisions? We don't know. We just don't know. Okay, so let's put some people together. Maybe people who died innocently. Of course, central to our question, since we're talking about the book of Job, would be Job's first family, right? Yeah. What about Abel? back in Genesis 4.8. What about the firstborn in Egypt? We've mentioned them briefly in the 10th plague. What about Uriah the Hittite? What happened to him? David Put, set him up. David set him up. Put him Jerem in front of the battle so, yeah. that he's, so that he's killed. Jeremiah was thrown into a terrible pit where he thought he was going to die. He didn't ultimately die. What about John the Baptist being, headed, being beheaded? Can you imagine? One day, all of a sudden, you're maybe waiting for lunch, and some guy shows up, hold on, my job to cut your head off, he won the king wants it. What? And in Daniel, uh, example, I was listening to some material today. Remember Daniel and his three friends in that first Daniel 2? The guy shows up at their house, knocks on the door, hi, yeah, what can we do for you? I've come here to kill you. Huh? And then Hebrews 11, 35 to 38. I'm just going to read those verses. What do you think of these people? Through faith, women received their dead relatives back to life. Others refusing to accept freedom died under torture in order to be raised to a better life. 
Some were mocked and whipped. Others were put in chains or taken off to prison. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were killed by the sword. They went around clothed in skins of sheep or goats, poor, persecuted, and ill-treated. The world was not good enough for them. They wandered like refugees in the desert hills, living in caves and holes in the ground. That's Paul's, I believe it was Paul who wrote, who wrote Hebrews at the end of, and that's the faith chapter. What about those people? Was it fair? By the way, who is it that keeps talking about being fair? The devil. Devil's big fair question is, how can you save these sinners and not save me? Is that fair? That was his cry right from the beginning, yep. wasn't it? I want to be like your son. Well, there are people who believe, as the Pharisees did in Jesus' day, that if we live righteous lives, everything is going to be peaceful sailing. Is that true? Devil's gonna work Not according to the story of Job. What? The devil's going to work even harder. Yeah. Well, Jesus himself said that there's enough evil in each day for that day, didn't he? Matthew 6, 34. The Greek word evil in that verse means badness, depravity, even malignity. Well, there's a famous verse found in Proverbs 3, verse 5, that says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, never rely on what you think you know. Is that good advice? I remember underlining that the first time I actually heard it mm -hmm. and thinking, you know, that's wise, <laughs> very wise information because we think we know something. Mm -hmm. One of the arguments that we've mentioned already that the Friends of Job brings up is Job, everybody knows that. Our fathers knew that. So, Job, is that a valid argument? No. No. Only if I'm making it. <laughs> I see. Okay. Job 14, 1 and 2. We are all born weak and helpless. All lead the same short, troubled life. We grow and wither as quickly as flowers. We disappear like shadows. Is that true? In the great yes. panorama of things, yes, yes. Our, our lives are short. And who said that? In Job 14? Mm-hmm. Well, it was Job. Yeah. And who was, who's, been a, who's been saying off and on in our lessons so far that, well, our lives are so short, etc. Okay. Even his, his, his accusers there, both sides were saying this. Is, is, that, is that true or not true? Are our lives, in terms, of, in terms of eternity, how long are our lives? Very short. Very, very short. So that's another point in this discussion that both sides agreed about, right? So not everything is just total black and white on one side and the other side. There are lots of things they agreed upon. Well, after studying even the first part of the book of Job, it should be impossible to deny the existence of a personal Satan. Without an understanding of the great controversy, it is virtually impossible, in my mind at least, to rationally explain the existence of evil. Even with an understanding of the great controversy, there are still some things which seem so unfair. But as Christians, we still have the hope because we have faith in that relationship with God on which we must rely. So, let me just ask you this question, and we'll, we'll, we'll come back to this from time to time, but what happened to the disciples between Crucifixion Friday and Pentecostal Sunday? They came together in one accord. They realized that there was a resurrection, that the person they'd spent significant portion of the past couple years 
some of them up to three years, uh, was God himself. Mm -hmm. They realized that. It put a new spin on everything. And what was the new spin? In, 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 in so many words, you don't have to be petrified of death. You know that there's something beyond. What is it that scares most people? It's the unknown. See, We know what's beyond death. We know what's beyond the grave. See? And we can, we can lay our family members, we can lay our friends in the grave knowing that there's a possibility, in fact, there's a certainty that they will rise out of those graves sometime in the future. We can't guarantee that they'll all be saved, but we can guarantee that they'll all be resurrected, can't we? Well, so in light of all we've said, is it easy to learn how to trust God from the things we can for the things we cannot see? Or do our current surroundings make it very difficult to trust God? Well, I just think back to Job. He had to have had conversations with God. Yeah. Now, did he see God? Did he just hear God? Uh, we don't know, do we? No, um, but we're going to get to chapter 29, where he talks about their previous relationship. And I think in light of that, I think we have to, we have to say there must have been conversations. And he may have lived about the time of Abraham. We know what happened to Abraham. Even God himself came down and ate lamb and you Abraham. You say that Abraham argued with God. Yeah. Yeah. I think we need to seek after all those things that are going to increase our faith and trust and yeah. try to put away all those things that would weaken it. If we try to just spend all kinds of time with the, the, the bad things of the world through television and movies and literature and various things, then that's going to weigh on us, but uh, we need to seek to try to know him as it is our privilege to know him. Yeah. Well, Albert Camus, we mentioned him back at the beginning of our discussion, who, let's be clear, he's an atheist, in another location said these words. I want you to think about this. There is but one truly serious philosophical problem, and that is suicide. Judging whether life is or is not worth living amounts to answering the fundamental question of philosophy. You think that's right? The only thing that really matters is whether we should live or whether we should kill ourselves? Seems well, a very... there's nothing else but on the other side of death, and that, I suppose, would be... Uh, if what you the think question would be, you know, should I continue living or should I kill myself and get, get it over with? Mm -hmm. But if there's an eternity beyond that, then, then that isn't the, the only question. Well, having read Job 1 and 2, which we keep referring back to, which as we should, we suddenly become aware of a source of problems that we otherwise could not even have dreamed of. Suffering now becomes not a situation in which we're involved in maybe this part, this state, or, or this country, or even this world. This is a universe-wide issue. And what, is, what does Paul tell us about our relationship to the rest of the universe? We're a theater. 1 Corinthians 4.9 For it seems to me that God has given the very last place to us apostles, like people condemned to die in public, as a spectacle, that's a theater, for the whole world of angels and of humanity. So this world, this little earth, has become the theater of the universe. Well, do we know what's going to happen on the other end of all this? You remember Revelation 21? Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. The first heaven and the first earth disappeared and the sea vanished. And I've had the privilege of visiting the Isle of Patmos. It's quite a ways out there in the, in the, in the Aegean Sea from the coastline, which is part of Turkey now. Um, 
you have to pass through some other islands and you get out there. But you could see the land. If you're up on the top of the, of the island, you look across, you can see the land. And Paul knows that over there are his friends. You mean John? John. I'm sorry, thank you. John, because I'm thinking about Paul. Paul a moment ago. John knows that over there are his friends. So he goes on, and I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared and ready, like a bride dressed to meet her husband. I heard a loud voice speaking from the throne, now God's home is with human beings. He will live with them and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and he will be their God. He will wipe away all tears from their eyes. There will be no more death, no more grief or crying or pain. The old things have disappeared. Is that worth looking forward to? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. No matter how many evil things attack us or, or affect us in one way or another, we must, we have those promises of God that we can take firm hold of and, and say, God, I may not be able to see here, but I know it's happening out there, right? There are a lot of people in our world, Christians in our world, who believe that Christ's judgment consists of his holding up a, a scales, you know. And if you go to the Supreme Court in Washington, D.C., you'll find the, the blinded judge holding up scales, right? And what's their idea of justice and salvation? You put your good deeds on this side and you put your bad deeds over there, and if there's more good deeds, you get saved. And if there's more bad deeds, you go to the other place, right? Is, is, that, is that true? No. No. German philosopher Arthur Schopenhauer used a powerful example to debunk the whole notion of some sort of balance between good and evil in this world. Now, at this point. The, and this are his, these are his words. The pleasure in this world, he wrote, it has been said, outweighs the pain. Or at any rate, there's an even balance between the two. If the reader wishes to see shortly whether this statement is true, let him compare the respective feelings of two animals, one of which is engaged in eating the other. How would you respond to the idea that good somehow balances out the evil? Does, I mean, is God up there just trying to make sure there's as much good as, as, Satan, as the evil that Satan can produce? Does he just want a balance? No, he wants to eradicate evil. He wants to eradicate evil. And what does Satan, Satan want to do? Eradicate Proliferate. Good. Keep it going. Keep it going as long as possible. Well, we know very well that in the Garden of Eden and in the future in the earth made new, there, will, there were and there, or there will be no carnivorous animals. And you've probably heard long discussions about what's going to happen to the teeth of lions and what's going to happen to their digestive system and are they going to be able to eat grass or <laughs> who knows, all that kind of stuff. You know what? God could take care of that. If God could create them in the beginning, mm -hmm. he can change them. Yeah. Well, that would be the question. Did he create carnivorous creatures in the beginning? Well, he created them in some way, mm -hmm. whether they were carnivorous or not. Maybe he'll revert them to the way they started. Okay, that sounds like a reasonable possibility. He has the I'm ability to do that. that for humans. <laughs> yeah. Carnivorous? You're tired not of it. Carnivorous. <laughs> changing us. Well, oh. so, some human beings are pretty carnivorous. Do all cases of suffering cause us to trust God more? Or should we just grow more bitter toward God? be like the martyrs under the altar how long you know how long Lord will you let this go on pray for for that uh, blessed hope Mar you know Maranatha come come Lord quickly mm -hmm. so how how does does suffering ever really help people's faith what what's the whole point of this discussion in the book of Job. I think in lots of cases it helps to get their priorities straighter than they might have been. Okay. 
helps to straighten out our priorities. Also, uh, sort of put a positive spin on it that he felt that he uh, he felt worthy to suffer for his sake. Mm -hmm. I don't remember the other end of the sentence, but uh, that the, mm -hmm. that there was something about suffering for Christ that that uh, made was a positive thing he felt, mm -hmm. uh, and that those sufferings were. Uh, what remains of the sufferings of Christ? It's it's like there, are, because we identify with Him. Jesus said, "We will suffer too," and so mm -hmm. I think Paul is identifying with that, uh, that he's part of that flow of things where there's going to be suffering for for His. We we here in the United States live in a world where there is an enormous number of people who think that their entire lives should be focused on entertainment. You all know that. <clears throat> Life what do you think? in the pursuit of happiness. There you go. Um, is that the pursuit of happiness? I heard once that there's a special um, declaration of independence, I guess, or a statute of, lim uh, of, of rights for bachelors. They believe in life, liberty, and the happiness of pursuit. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, in light of all of, of all that, how do we? I mean, could you could you take one of those people whose life is focused on entertainment, and could you set them down and convince them that suffering was a good idea, and that they should benefit from it? Might be tough. No, because it needs to be in the context of a love relationship with Christ. So you you really need to bring them Jesus first. Uh, uh, that's that's where suffering becomes um, acceptable. I see. Well, in light of the fact that so many wars, as we know down through history, have been started because of religious intolerance toward others whose beliefs are different than ours, how should we feel about the undeserved suffering resulting from war, terrorism, etc.? Does it make you angry against God for allowing such a thing? Ellen White spoke of a group of people that she saw in vision in heaven with red borders on their garments. She was told that those people will be especially honored because they died martyrs' deaths. Is that enough reason for us to say that the suffering should be tolerated? Here's, here's her words. As we were traveling along, we met a company who also were gazing at the glories of the place. I noticed red as a border on their garments. Their crowns were brilliant. Their robes were pure white. As we greeted them, I asked Jesus who they were. He said they were martyrs that had been slain for him. With them was an innumerable company of little ones. They also had a hem of red on their garments. And that was one of the, actually a part of the very first vision that Ellen White had. So why would little ones be martyred? Why would children, babies, be martyred? Well. Can we ask that question a little bit different way? Do children get hurt when there's a war going on? Do children yeah, absolutely. get absolutely? Is that is that being a martyr to be a no, victim I don't of think so. of well, random violence? The in innocence in or Bethlehem. Non -random. Yeah, you know, the the babies in Bethlehem that were killed. Uh, well, and, and that was that was the next Jesus. point that we're going to talk about. After they had left, they escaped to Egypt. Uh, um, you know the story about. Uh, about the, 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 the wise men who came from the east and talked to Herod and went and found baby Jesus and then went back by a different route. After they had left, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph and said, Herod will be looking for the child in order to kill him. So get up, take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt and stay there until I tell you to leave. Joseph got up, took the child and his mother and left during the night for Egypt where he stayed until Herod died. This was done to make what the Lord had said to the prophet come true. I called my son out of Egypt. I mean, try to imagine, Myra, you're the mother in this crowd. Try to imagine someone shows up at your house in the evening or maybe in the middle of the night or whatever and says, I'm here. Do you have any babies in this house? If you have anybody under the age of two, I'm going to kill them. Any boys under the age of two, I'm going to kill them. It just blows me away to think about it. And that would include grandchildren. 
Yeah. 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 Grandchildren. Even grandchildren? Yeah. Whoa. You're not getting my grandchildren. <laughs> no mine. <laughs> well, is this the first time Satan has tried to kill a bunch of children or or prevent the the coming of the Messiah? Moses was escaped from a mass murder also. Now, the children of Egypt, I mean, the, the people of Egypt were told, or what were they told? If you find a baby boy among the Israelites, among the Israelites kill him. Try to imagine that. Can you think of another example? There's another time. Well, the plagues in Egypt. Okay, well, Lord, but that was, I'm, I'm talking about where, where specific efforts were made to kill God's people. What about the story of Esther? Yeah. Wasn't that another attempt by, by a Satan to try to eliminate God's people? Or even the Babylonian captivity. Yeah. The Assyrian captivity. Yeah. Why do you think God felt it was necessary to call Job blameless and upright before the entire group of representatives from around the universe? Remember that God, of course, knew what the result would be, didn't he? In Job 10, we, were start, we started our lesson, where we started our lesson, Job effectively said to God, please let me alone so that I can suffer in peace. Isn't my life almost over? Leave me alone. Let me enjoy the time I have left. Is that a reasonable request? <coughs> well, both the Old and New Testaments, and we're running out of time, are, <coughs> clearly on the sin, uh, are clear on the sinful nature of the humanity. Uh, Romans 3, 10 to 20, and lots of other verses we've talked about. Um, in the light of these speeches that have, we have considered, both the accusations of Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar, and Job's responses, do you see any reason for hope or any comfort? Or do they promote confusion and questions about the character of God? As we have mentioned in previous lessons, God places a very high value on every single human being. He would have sent his son to die for just one of us. So what questions would you like to ask Christian martyrs when you meet them in heaven? What questions would we have for groups like the Waldenses? Think about what happened to them. And I'm going to throw those questions to you as we wrap up. Our kind and loving Father, we have raised a lot of questions in this discussion. You have raised the questions and we're just responding to them. It must have seemed so unfair to Job, and maybe even to Job's friends, but they thought they knew why it had happened. Now help us to clearly keep in mind the role you want us to play here in the final events of this earth's history, and not to be like Job's friends is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.